Hello. So today we'll be discussing two 19th century Mughal paintings um, made in North India. Um, the first is uh, this one. Uh, this shows the fourth uh, Mughal Emperor Jahangir seated in an outdoor court. Um, and amusingly, his feet, the soles of his feet are being licked by two tigers. And behind you see uh, a palace pavilion. And behind that, you see a kind of picturesque landscape. Um, this is a painting that's been done on ivory. And the second painting that we will be discussing today um, is a work on paper, um, which shows a plump partridge. It's a brown bird, a partridge, which would have been eaten um, in the Mughal times from the 16th century onwards. Uh, it was called a titar. So titar is the Hindi Urdu word for partridge. Um, so today we'll be discuss, uh, talking about both these paintings in comparison, and we'll be talking about uh, their context, their 17th century context, and also their, you know, their actual 19th century context in which they were created. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about why is it's, it's useful to look at both of them together. Um, and we will also talk a about, little bit about why it's problematic to think about 19th century painting um, as a painting uh, of simply European influence or simply a painting of decline. So um, this work is, uh, is a painting on ivory. And it is um, the, the colors that have been used is a, 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 a material called gouache, which is actually opaque watercolor. And opaque watercolor is, uh, is simply watercolor with a binding agent like gum arabic. And it makes the colors really deep and rich. Uh, it's not as thick as oil. And neither is it as like washy like watercolor. So it's something in between. Um, and both these are so opaque watercolor, but this one is on ivory and this one's um, on paper. So um, before we can talk about their 19th century context, I want to talk a little bit about how these two works actually take us back to the 17th century uh, Mughal Empire. So we know that this painting here depicts the Emperor Jahangir. Uh, because there is a golden halo around him. And we know that the first use of halos happened, uh, started happening with uh, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. As you see, this, this is a portrait with him um, with a halo. And here, here is Jahangir again seated at a Sufi shrine. And you can see there's a halo around him. And his father, Akbar, even though there were portraits of him, there were never um, you know, halos around him. So we can see clearly that um, the notion of portraits with a halo really started with the fourth Mughal Emperor Jahangir. So it is fairly certain that this is a representation in the 19th century of Jahangir. Again, the other reason why we think that it's probably Jahangir is because um, with Jahangir, you really get an interest in allegorical painting. For example, you see him here standing on a globe, and he's hugging the Safavid um, Sultan, uh, the Shah, uh, Shah Abbas. And he's standing on a lion while Shah Abbas is standing on a, on a lamb. So uh, trying to say that we've become friends again, but really you are the weaker one because you're standing on a lamb. Um, so again, um, and also another one here where Jahangir is sitting on an hourglass, and he's meeting um, various uh, sages and Sufi saints, including uh, the King of England at the time, James I. Um, and so the use of allegory in painting really starts with Jahangir. And so here you really you get a sense of allegory again because you have tigers licking his feet. Now we don't know whether that event really happened or whether the notion of tigers licking his feet is really a way to to show how strong he is and um, to show his power and, and authority. The other thing that's of interest is that with Jahangir, you get this interest in the depiction of flora and fauna. He was very interested in detailed depictions of animals that he saw and birds that he saw. We also know, for example, that um, in his memoirs, the Jahangir Nama, he's written about, you know, uh, shooting tigers, killing tigers, and hunting them, and representing them after after the fact. Um, so the fact that tigers are represented here again as Jahangir's way of uh, showing his authority may not be a surprise. Um, 
here uh, you have a very famous painting from Jahangir's memoirs uh, showing a turkey. And this turkey was given as a gift to him by Jesuit missionaries from uh, who had come to the south of India and were part of the Mughal court. And um, he was really, really um, interested in this bird. And he had the artist depicted with great detail and great precision. And you see the similar detail and precision here in this partridge, where you can see um, the blue of the eyeball, the orange around the eyeball. Um, and then, you know, the differing colors of the feathers, the dark on top, the light at the bottom. So really a careful attention to detail, almost as if it was a scientific um, study. So now, um, moving away from the 17th century context, uh, how does all of this relate to the 19th century? Why were these being reproduced again? Now, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the Mughal court uh, was fairly restricted. It had become uh, restricted towards just the city of Delhi or its surroundings um, because there was obviously growing European and British influence through the in the shape of the East India Company, the British East India Company. So with them coming in, you really see a clash of power between the Mughal court and the British East India Company. You also start seeing new patrons. So the East India Company is a new patron for the court artists, and they want new kinds of pictures, new kinds of images. Um, so you start seeing an interest in, for example, architecture, an interest in picturesque views, and an interest, interest again in scientific studies of everything Indian, animals, birds, landscapes. So this is how we can read this study of the partridge in an, in an attempt to know about the Indian subcontinent, in, in an attempt to learn about it. Um, and here you see again that the uh, emphasis on great architectural detail um, and this kind of picturesque landscape at the back with um, you know trees and flowers and a flowing river. So it's trying to incorporate this British love for picturesque aesthetic, this interest in great detail, which is then put in the small size, which miniature, which is what the Mughals, of course, uh, uh, were painting is really um, kind of known for. Um, but at the same time, I think that company school painting, that the term company school painting for works as diverse as this can be a little reductive because it assumes that only the East India Company were the patrons of these works and that the Indian artists were simply just uh, incorporating Western influence as their patrons told them to do. And that is really um, not the case. Um, because if you look at the tradition of you know, painting portraits of Mughal emperors. It, it goes back to the 16th century um, when portraits were made of Mughal emperors, such as this one, and given as gifts. Um, and the notion of gifting is interesting because if you, if it was given as a gift to somebody who was, uh, you know, kind of lower than you um, in terms of a, a lower noble and so on, um, it actually meant that, look, I am more powerful. I'm the one who's giving you a gift. So the British soon caught on to this, that the fact that the Mughal emperors were giving them gifts of their own portraits was really a way to kind of not put them down, but to just show how superior the Mughal emperors were. Uh, but having said that, the British, of course, um, with their love of traveling and souvenirs really uh, kind of caught on to these paintings. And here is an example of um, some pi picturesque views of the ancient monuments of India done on ivory and then framed in an oval frame. And so these became souvenirs. Um, that the tra British travelers would take back. And they would also take back portraits. For example, here are portraits of Mughal emperors and queens in a bracelet form. So this portrait can also be seen in a similar, maybe not as a bracelet, but, but of course in a similar line as, you know, as a souvenir that a European traveler would be taking back from India as you know, part, of its, part of his or her Mughal experience. Um, and the reason why painting started to be done um, in ivory is because ivory was more portable. It could be shaped into bracelets. It could be shaped into boxes. Um, it could be put, the portrait could be put into a, uh, you know, a leather cover. It could be put on a wooden desk. So it just became a much more portable souvenir um, type of thing. 
So um, I think that what we can say about both of these paintings is that we should not look at them as simply company school painting made in the 19th century for the European market and therefore not uh, significant or you know interesting enough or therefore only look at it from the lens of a collectible for the you know Western traveler but really also uh, from the lens of innovation such as first paintings being done on ivory and secondly the fact that in this painting you see the Mughal Emperor Jahangir surrounded by courtiers and you know by you know with tigers licking his feet clearly to show his importance so in the 19th century um, the Mughal Emperor was not Jahangir rather it was this person here, Bahadur Shah Zafar II in 1850. So it was during his reign perhaps that this painting was created. Um, so in a way what this painting does is that it tells the European collector that the Mughal emperors are still strong and powerful um, and that, you know, e that they have this glorious heritage going back to Jahangir and that their strength can be seen uh, by the fact that there are all of these courtiers surrounding him, that you see this sumptuously decorated uh, palace at the back, and the fact that he's being, you know, uh, given almost uh, obs uh, kind of, uh, these tigers are almost kind of uh, behaving like pet dogs around him. Um, the other reason why in the 19th century the image of the tiger would have been important is because there was a Muslim ruler in southern India, a person called Tipu Sultan, and he, his um, royal motif was a tiger, and he had a mechanical toy um, which you, if you wound up, and it would, it, it would start, it, it would be a tiger that's kind of like eating an English soldier. So if you wound it up, the tiger would start making, you know, kind of roaring sounds as if it was eating the soldier, and the soldier would make wailing sounds. So this, this, this contraption, this toy really kind of became um, an image of exotic India for the Europeans. It became an image of the savage Tipu uh, and so on. And so it's, and, and of course Tipu Sultan was defe defeated in the late 18th century by the British. So again, the use of the tigers again here in the 19th century uh, by Jahangir, uh, to, with Jahangir um, in this 19th century context could be referring to the fact that uh, of uh, you know, Indian supremacy or Mughal supremacy in the face of British um, encroachment. Um, so just kind of in conclusion with um, what we are uh, in uh, about both these paintings, what we can say is that although they are made in the 19th century, they, s they show us continu a continuation of motifs from the 17th century. Um, uh, through Jahangir's uh, portraits and his interest in flora and fauna and his interest in detail and scientific studies. So we see a continuation of uh, these interests, but we also see changes, uh, you know, catering to the rising souvenir market uh, for th the British who are collecting such images, but they also show the power and authority of the Mughal Empire in the face of British encroachment. Thank you.